Welcome to Genetics of GIST, Risks, Management, and What to Know for You and Your Family. My name is Sarah Rothschild, the VP of Program Services, and I am your moderator for today. During this seminar, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation using questions submitted through the Q&A feature. Please remember the information provided in this web seminar is not intended as a substitute for your, gu for your physician's guidance and care. I'd like to introduce our two panelists today, Lindsay Kipnis and Becca Vanderwall. They are both licensed and certified genetic counselors currently practicing at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And we are very excited to hear their presentation today. So feel free ladies to begin. All right. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, um, for the invitation to come and speak today. We are very excited about this presentation. Um, and with that, I'll get started. So um, as Sarah mentioned, we will be talking about the risk management and what to know for you and your family during this presentation. Um, and so just a overview for the session. Um, first, we'll be talking about an overview of GIST and genetics in general. Then we'll go on to somatic and germline testing, the differences between the two, how to undergo testing in either of these settings, some specific syndromes after that. And then I'll end with talking about genetic testing and communication of test results. And so for starters, what is a GIST? Um, so a GIST is a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. They are classified as mesenchymal tumors of the GI tract. Um, they, are, they are connective tissue tumors, so they will be classified as sarcomas. You'll see them that way. Most of them do start in the stomach or the small intestine. But as you can see in the diagram, there are some that will occur in the esophagus and the colon and rectum as well. Most are driven by activating mutations in KIT or PDG FRA. And about 10% of them are hereditary when they're accompanied by other features. And then what is genetic counseling? So what do Beck and I do every day? Um, we start by taking a medical history and review of systems. Um, so things like screenings, mammograms, colonoscopies, um, and any specific findings that you may have from a dermatology standpoint as well. And then from there, we go into what does the family history look like? Um, so the FHQ stands for Family History Questionnaire. So some centers have a electronic family history gathering tool that they sent out to patients. It generally will be either three or four generations. So if you count yourself as the first, we'll go parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles, and cousins will all be included on the pedigree or the family history tree. It, um, in our case, is focused on cancer, but we'll also ask questions about non-cancer features as well. So cafe au lait spots or light colored coffee, colored marks on your skin. Are there anyone who has developmental delays in the family or multiple miscarriages, which it can also raise red flags for us in genetics. From there, we'll perform a risk assessment. So what is the likelihood that we are gonna identify anything um, through genetic testing for you? Provide education. So what is genetic testing? What is the outcome of it all? How do we follow you based upon that information? Offer testing if it is appropriate. Help you to decide what's the right decision for you. How much testing do you want? Do you want testing at all? That's what we're here to help guide you with. Um, and last but not least, to actually coordinate that testing for you if you decide to move forward and to go over those results once they come back in. Um, and for a risk assessment, what we're looking for in the family are, are there young ages of onset? Um, so different cancers have different ages that we consider a young age of onset. Um, so breast cancer is typically 45 and under, colon cancer is about 50 and under would be considered a young age of onset. Are there multiple primary cancers that are occurring in one individual? So does a person have breast and colon cancer or a benign endocrine tumor and breast cancer? Um, 
is there a strong family history of cancer? So again, we do those three generations. So we're looking to see, are there um, in grandparents, parents, and children, similar cancer types that are, we can see going along with genetic syndromes. Are there specific cancers that are occurring that are very, very strongly related to a hereditary syndrome? Is there actually any known genetic syndrome or mutation in the family? Is there a rare type of cancer? So just pheochromocytomas all fall in the rare type of cancer category. They are not very common. And so pretty much anyone who has one of these will get referred in to see someone in genetics um, to talk about how, whether that could be hereditary or not. And the last thing is if someone has tumor testing that reveals a possible germline mutation. Um, so I will talk more about somatic or tumor testing versus germline testing, um, but sometimes tumor testing can still tell us what might be present in your germline or in every cell of your body. Um, so sometimes people get referred in based upon that indication as well. And then really our goal is to also identify other families, members who may benefit from counseling or testing. So sometimes the person that we're meeting with may not be the best person to undergo genetic testing because they've never had a cancer diagnosis themselves and there isn't a mutation that's known in the family. Um, so sometimes we'll say, okay, well, your mom who had a GIST may be a better person to start genetic testing with um, as that would provide more clarity to um, our current patient's test results. Um, and then the risk assessment alone can provide a clearer understanding of a person's um, and family member's risk to develop certain types of cancer. So we don't always necessarily need to do genetic testing, um, but it can aid in determining um, how likely someone is to develop any particular types of cancers or tumors. And then going all the way back to when we were all in high school and um, learning about genetics in our science classes. Um, so we are all made up of millions of different cells. In all of the cells of our body, they contain our chromosomes. Our chromosomes are numbered one through 21. And then pair 22 is our sex chromosomes. They determine whether we will be men or women. Um, and then those chromosomes are condensed information from a lot of different genes that we have. Um, so we all have about 25,000 different genes in our body. And some of those, a small portion of them can be related to cancer risk if there's a mutation in one of them. And so when we do genetic testing, we're looking at genes. We're looking at a subset of all of your genes to see are they working the way that they're supposed to or is there a mutation or a change in one of them? But sometimes you can also do protein testing. Um, and that's generally done on someone's tumor um, because what it does is it looks to see is the protein present or not. If the protein's present, then the gene has to be working because it enabled the body to create that protein. If the protein's absent, then that makes us think that there's probably something wrong with the gene or it's not able to do its job. Um, and so that can prompt genetic testing as well. And so what is a gene mutation? So our genes are made up of four letters, A, C, T, and G. So not all of these that are actually listed in the word theater. Um, but what they are is they're supposed to be in a certain pattern. So they are, they may not make words we actually understand, but they do make words and they're in a right sequence to be able to be read correctly. And so in this case, this is what we would call the wild type, where this is the normal copy, where you can clearly see that it makes a word correctly. You understand that that's theater. That's the word that it's supposed to be. Sometimes a person has a mutation or a change in their gene that stops it from being able to do what it's supposed to. So in this case, you can see that instead of the E and A, there's an X and Q. So that word doesn't make sense anymore. Um, and therefore, when the words don't make sense, the genes can't create those proteins. They can't do the job that they were supposed to do. Mutations can be simple substitutions where the wrong letter ends up in a spot. 
they can be large deletions. So you could actually be missing the entire word of theater in your genes. Um, they can be duplication. So there are a large variety of mutations that can occur. But at the end of the day, if we're calling something a mutation, it means that the gene doesn't do what it's supposed to do anymore. So regardless of which type it is, it lost its ability to function as we would want it to. And then how do cancers actually form or how can cancers form? So we all have two copies of all of our genes because we get one copy from our mom and we get one copy from our dad. Now in this diagram, green is indicative or light green is indicative of a wild type or the normal copy. So in someone who isn't born with a predisposition, they're born with two healthy working copies of this gene. Through lifestyle, environmental factors, they may lose one of their copies. So now they acquired a mutation. That's the red. Um, but that's okay. They still have another copy of that gene that does its job and is able to stop, in most cases, tumors from forming in the body. But unfortunately, as we age, something may come around and knock out the remaining copy. Now you have no functioning copy of that gene left no ability to stop a tumor from forming. So cells tend to proliferate or grow, and that's ultimately what leads to a cancer diagnosis. For someone who has a hereditary predisposition in every cell of their body, they are born with one working copy and one non-working copy. So they are one step closer than everyone else is to developing that cancer or tumor that's why we tend to see the younger ages of onset and rare types of cancer forming because they're at a higher chance than the general population is to develop those. And then what does it mean, somatic versus germline? So somatic mutations mean that in every cell of your body, you have two working copies. Um, so these are both indicative that they both work. They're doing what they're supposed to do. In your tumor that has formed though, they do genetic testing and they find that you do in fact have no working copies of that gene left. That means that your tumor was formed because of these mutations, but if it's not present in every cell of your body, then you cannot pass it on to family members. So somatic genetic testing is generally used to determine treatment implications. So is there a more targeted treatment that they should be giving you because of what caused your tumor, in essence, to form? And there are different labs that do somatic testing versus those that do germline testing. Um, so those are somatic-only mutations. On the flip side, you have germline mutations so again, someone who is born in every cell of their body with one working copy and one non-working copy. So you'll see the same outcome in their tumor. So from a somatic standpoint, you cannot distinguish between whether someone was born with a mutation or someone acquired those mutations. Germline genetic testing is what is, allows us to distinguish between the two. So we look at the cells that you were born with. So either blood or saliva um, will tell us what you were born with, and it'll let us know, were you born with two working copies or were you born with one working copy and one non-working copy? If you were born with one non-working copy, that's when your children or your relatives have a chance to have that same mutation. So generally, we say first-degree relatives, so parents, siblings, and children would have a 50% chance to have whatever mutation you've been identified to have. Um, and we can do testing for them based upon that information. Not all of our genes have ch children implications or implications for children. Um, so we don't always test in the pediatric setting, um, but in terms of the endocrine tumor genes that we typically think of, most of those will have implications for children. Um, so we would do testing for them based upon it. And that's what we consider a germline cancer predisposition. So someone born at a higher likelihood to develop a cancer diagnosis.
<laughs> most of our talk is going to be more focused on, sorry, the um, germline genetics, but just for a little background about somatic mutations in GIS. About 85% of sporadic GIS, so happening totally by chance, are due to somatic activation of KIT or PDGFRA, meaning that in your tumor, they found that you do have mutations in this gene, and that's what caused your tumor to grow. Testing often occurs automatically after a GIST diagnosis. So depending on your um, treating hospital, we at Dana-Farber tend to do this in-house, uh, meaning that it's done automatically. A patient doesn't necessarily sign anything specific to have it done because so many of them happen because of these mutations and they guide your treatment recommendations that they are considered an essential part of your diagnosis. And again, in this setting, family members are not at an increased risk to develop just because this happened by chance for you. Um, so there's nothing that you can pass on to your family members to put them at a higher risk based upon it. And then what Becca and I again spend most of our days doing is hereditary cancers. So if we looked at most cancer types and put them all in this pie chart, about 80%, the largest bulk by far, are going to be sporadic. They're going to be due to lifestyle, environment, chance, age. Unfortunately, the older we are, the higher our likelihood is to develop a cancer diagnosis. A small percentage, about 10 to 15%, are going to be familial. And that is when it's not just genetics or environment, it's that combination of the two that puts you at a higher risk to develop a cancer diagnosis. And those are the hardest because you can't test for familial cancer risk, but that's where our risk assessment comes into play, where we can say, okay, based upon these you know, characteristics of your family, we would estimate you do have a higher risk to develop X, Y, and Z type cancers and can still offer you screening based upon that information. What we focus on is that five to 10% that are hereditary. So someone who um, inherited a mutation in a cancer predisposition syndrome. Um, and um, so KIT and PDGFRA are mostly somatic mutations. In a very, very small subset, they can be germline where someone was actually born with a mutation in either their KIT gene or their PDGFRA gene. And that also contributed to them developing these benign tumors. In families that have KIT mutations, we often see that they'll have mastocytosis as well, which is just a buildup of mast cells under your skin. Um, and then with PDG-FRA mutations, they can be seen in individuals who have inflammatory fibroid polyps. Um, so generally in the colon is where they tend to occur and are a particular subtype of polyps. Like I said, both of these are very rare um, and they both tend to be seen in families that have multiple family members with GIS. Um, so if we're seeing someone and they don't have any family history of a GIS, they are an isolated GIS, then the likelihood we'd identify a mutation in either one of these genes is honestly probably less than 1%. We still recommend testing for it just to be on the safe side. Um, but the likelihood is pretty low that we'd actually identify a mutation in it. What we tend to see more of are mutations in the SDHX genes. Um, so the SDH genes are a combination of SDH A, B, C, D, and AF2. I don't know what happened to E. They just decided to skip it. Um, mutations in any of these genes lead to a diagnosis of hereditary paraganglioma and pheochromocytoma syndrome. Those are very big words. Um, FEOs, as we like to refer to them as, are benign tumors of the adrenal gland. Um, so your adrenal glands sit right on top of your kidneys um, and they are responsible for our fight or flight response. They release adrenaline into our body. Um, so while we classify them as a benign tumor, they can still be really harmful because of the excess adrenaline into a person's body based upon it. And paragangliomas are, are in essence the same tumor, but outside the adrenal gland. 
Um, so they can be secreting where they can release adrenaline or they can be non-secreting where they don't release any hormones. Um, but they can be in an area of the body where if they grow too big, they can also still become a problem. Um, so that's why we like to know that someone has this so we can follow them more carefully for it. Just tend to be more commonly seen with SDHA and SDHC mutations. So just are represented um, by this green chunk. So you can just see that the percentage of people who have these mutations you have just is much higher than the other um, benign tumors that we can see. Um, and there is actually a founder mutation in SDHC. And what that means is that in the French Canadian population, they have a higher likelihood to have an SDHC mutation than the general population does. Um, so founder mutations are just mutations that are unique generally to certain populations and at higher frequencies than we would expect to see. That's the only one in the SDH genes that we know about. The other syndrome that we think about with hereditary GISTs are is NF1 or neurofibromatosis type one. It is associated with those cafe au lait spots or those coffee colored spots on your skin. You can have axillary or in the armpit freckling. Um, and the most commonly are these benign nerve sheath tumors, which are called neurofibromas. Generally, they look like little growth like cysts almost on your skin. Um, and they are a little squishy to the touch. Um, and people can have one of them. They can be have hundreds of them. So it does present very variable, um, even amongst families that all family members that all have the same NF1 mutation. It is often diagnosed in childhood based on clinical features by around seven to eight. Um, so just are not the biggest component of tumors that we see in patients who have NF1. Um, so if you're an adult and haven't ever been told you have NF1 or have any of these features um, and you develop a GIST, then it would be unlikely to be related to NF1 um, because they're rarely seen in families that have GIST only. Uh, all of these genes that I've spoken about are all inherited in the same way. And that's what we call an autosomal dominant inheritance, meaning that um, it has been running through your family in most cases. Um, so again, wild type or normal copy here. Um, and then there's a copy, the other copy has a mutation that's in it. So in this case, um, this is just a very basic pedigree or a family medical tree. Um, females are drawn as circles, males are drawn as squares. Um, so this man inherited his father's mutation. Um, and then we were testing the kids and the daughter inherited her dad's um, mutation and inherited a wild type or normal copy from mom. And the son inherited both wild type copies. So the son does not have a inherited predisposition. It doesn't always really work out where it's 50-50, where if you have two kids, one does and one doesn't. Um, but for explaining purposes, it made the most sense to have one child that has it and one child that doesn't. Um, so that's sort of why we recommend testing to all first degree relatives. Again, parents, siblings, kids, because um, they're the ones who have a 50% chance to have it. And then based upon that testing, we can expand even further to other family members. Um, why this sometimes can come up even younger for people um, is for family planning. So sometimes there is a different condition that results if a person inherits a mutation in both copies of the same gene. Um, and that's what we call autosomal recessive. So for SDHA, if a person inherits two non-working copies, they have Lee syndrome. Um, for SDHB, they have a mitochondrial complex two deficiency. Basically these both lead to mitochondrial diseases if a person inherits two non-working copies. Um, so in that case, both mom and dad would have to be carriers or have a mutation in one of their copies for there to be a child that has a mutation in both of their copies. If both parents have a mutation, again, in the same gene, um, then there's a 25% chance that they have a child who inherits both mutations. 
um, and has that different condition. So sometimes um, when we're seeing people who are of childbearing age, we will recommend testing to their partners to make sure that they don't have a mutation in any of these genes. None of these things that we talk about in genetics are common. So they're all rare or exceedingly rare, um, but because of the implications of having a child with a mitochondrial disease, we do wanna make sure that we're, we are testing anyone who's thinking about having a child. And then management. So there are extra screenings for individuals with hereditary risk with the goal of early detection. So in our genetics clinic, we follow people who don't have a GIST or a Theo or a para, but are at a higher risk to develop those tumors. Mainly because people who have GISTs or Theos or paras um, are generally followed by their oncologist or their endocrinologist. Um, and when they're enough years out, they may shift back and follow again in genetics, but for the time being, they're followed based on their diagnosis and people in genetics are followed based on their genetic risk to develop these tumors. It is based on the specific syndrome. So these are gonna be a little bit more vague. They're not in response to any specific syndrome um, because for a lot of them, we are still learning exactly what the right screening should look like. Um, and there are no consensus guidelines at this point. So every center may do things a little differently based upon each syndrome. Some of the things that we can do include MRIs. So generally um, they're depending again on the exact gene you have um, for the SDH genes, they're generally done from the base of the skull to the top of the pelvis um, because you can develop paragangliomas anywhere in that kind of space. Um, we can do blood work or urine analysis to look for um, the catecholamines or the metanephrines, which are the um, hormones secreted by these pheos that can develop. Um, and given the skin findings with NF1 and some of our other syndromes, we can also recommend dermatology evaluations as well. Um, and even in the SDH genes, there's still different recommendations, A, B, C, and D. Um, so that's sort of why this slide was perfectly left. Um, specifically left a little vague. So that to say, it's gonna be based on your center and the doctor that's following you for all of this. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Becca now. Thank you, Lindsay. So while we're thinking about all of these syndromes, um, all of this idea of genetic predisposition, we start thinking about seeing a genetic counselor and considering some genetic testing. Um, and what this slide shows is that there's actually multiple options for how to pursue your genetic testing. And more and more, we're offering what we call bigger and bigger cancer panels. So you'll see that or hear that word panel, um, which just means a list of genes. It means you're not just being tested for one thing, but reading through the code or um, those kind of words that Lindsay showed, looking for mutations, in multiple different genes at the same time. Um, so the smallest circle is showing the, the smallest option, which is single gene or syndrome specific testing. Um, this is usually now done for someone who already has a known mutation in their family. So someone in this person's family has had genetic testing, has found that they carry a hereditary predisposition and is now disseminating that information to their relatives to consider their own testing because they may benefit from that extra screening or management that Lindsay noted. So we already know what the risk in the family is and we can kind of zoom in and test one specific thing. The bigger circles from there are mostly just options based on what kind of information you want to get back from your testing. So if you are someone who has had a diagnosis, like a GIST, um, and you go see a genetic counselor to consider your own testing, you may consider looking at the genes that Lindsay mentioned. You may say, I just want to know if there's a known hereditary cause behind my GIST, so I only want you to tell me if there's a mutation in any of those genes, KIT, PDGFRA, the SDH genes, or NF1. And that's your specific kind of cancer type focused testing. Um, but 
you might talk to your genetic counselor and say, I want those genes. Those are most important based on my referral, but I want to get a little bit broader. I want to learn if I have any other risks because it may affect how I get followed in the future, or it may give me more information about my kids and my family. This is especially relevant if you have a family history of other types of cancers or tumors. So we can consider your genetic testing to um, run the, the gamut of the types of cancers that have been in your family to clarify if there's any cause, hereditary cause behind any of them. Um, it may be relevant, like Lindsay mentioned, for those certain founder mutations. If you have a certain type of ancestry, then you may have a higher chance for mutations in other genes. Or it may just be something that you're interested in, in terms of getting as much information about your hereditary risk back as possible. So all of these options will potentially be presented to you when you talk about getting genetic testing. Um, and what's important is if you've had um, a genetic test before and it's been smaller or more targeted, um, then at some point you may consider updated testing for one of these broader tests, especially as we learn more about genetics and genetic testing um, and, and learn potentially new genes that can cause hereditary risks. Um, then a new updated test might be offered to you and you would have these options again. Okay, Lindsay, you can um, click to the next slide. All right, so if you have this testing, one of the things to think about are the types of results that can come back or the pros and cons of doing these broader tests include what kind of information you can get back. With any genetic test, there's three possible results. One is positive, meaning we identify one of those mutations in a gene that causes hereditary risk, that we talk about how to um, change your medical management or screening moving forward, and we talk about testing your family members. Two is negative, meaning that we don't find any mutations in any of these genes, that if you've had a GIST, um, that it might be sporadic or no hereditary cause behind it, there's a small chance that there is some kind of hereditary cause that we can't find with our current knowledge or technology, but nothing extra to text your, test your family members for because there's no known hereditary risk at this time. The last type of result is an uncertain result that we give a fancy term variant of uncertain significance. If you think back to um, Lindsay's slide where she showed a mutation or a misspelling, when genetic testing labs do this analysis, they do sometimes find benign misspellings, changes in the letter code of your gene that actually don't affect how your gene functions, how the protein functions, or therefore your health risks in any way. And benign stuff gets sifted out and doesn't even get reported back on your genetic testing report. But because of that, genetic testing labs are really careful not to give you a false negative. So if they find a misspelling and they say, you know what, we just don't have enough data to know for sure if this is affecting the gene's function, um, then they will put it on your genetic testing report as this uncertain result. The more genes that you test, the more that you might identify some of these variants of uncertain significance. The good thing is that the majority of the time they end up being found to be benign with more data or research, but some people want to limit the amount of uncertainty that they can get back in their testing, and that might affect whether you consider one of those broader gene panels if you have genetic testing or not. Um, you can click to the next slide. Perfect. One of the other things that we get lots of questions about, so I wanted to bring up, is when people are considering getting genetic testing, they want to know how it might affect their insurance or their insurance coverage. So the good thing is that there is a federal law called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA, and GINA helps to make sure that your health insurance or your medical insurance are not allowed to discriminate against you based on genetic testing results. 
So if you have testing and you find one of these gene mutations, we want your health insurance actually to learn about it because we want them to cover the extra screening that we suggest based on it. Um, and so they might learn about it, but they can't um, change your premiums, drop you from coverage. They can't do anything different based on your genetic testing results specifically. And same with employers, except for small exceptions, like if you work at a really tiny company. Um, but Lindsay, if you click again, things that Gina just doesn't talk about or doesn't cover are mostly things like long-term um, care or life insurance. And what that ends up meaning is that if you're looking to take out a life insurance policy and you have a gene mutation, the company you're looking to take it out from might send you a medical questionnaire, ask you a whole bunch of questions about your medical history. Um, and there's no federal law that tells them that they can't ask about your genetic testing history and use that information in their big algorithm to decide whether to cover you or how much to cover you for. We don't know how often life insurance companies are taking advantage of this or asking. We do know that there's state laws in some states that help prevent this from happening, but it's not perfect. It can depend on where the company is based. It can depend on a whole bunch of other things. So it's important to talk about those details with your healthcare providers if they're concerns for you um, before you move forward with genetic testing. Okay, um, and then this is, you can click a couple times, get some more bullets. This was kind of just my, the rest of things to remember if you think about getting genetic testing. I'll go back, one. there we go. Um, which is that genetic testing does not diagnose you with cancer. Again, it's all about that predisposition or if you were born with an increased risk to develop cancer. If you have had cancer, your genetic testing can be normal. There's people with no hereditary risk that still develop cancer for a variety of reasons. There's also people who have hereditary risk that never develop cancer. Hereditary risk tells you that you have a higher chance than other people, but it doesn't mean that your chance is 100%. And genetic testing can't tell you if and or when a diagnosis could occur, which is why we focus on things like screening and management. In case you were to develop a new diagnosis, there's a goal of finding it early because we're already looking. Um, and like Lindsay mentioned before, if you have that familial cancer or you have a strong family history, which a genetic counselor can help you assess, and sometimes there's extra screening or management that's suggested, even if your genetic testing results are normal, knowing that we just can't find the reason behind those cancers in your family, but we think that there might still be a higher risk. So there's lots of, to talk about with your healthcare team, your doctors, your genetic counselor together to think about what's best for you, both in terms of genetic testing and in terms of moving forward with your family, no matter what your results are. Um, all right, so actually getting genetic testing, how does this actually work? Um, when we were seeing people in person, we would often do blood draws. Um, you'd go and get your blood drawn and sent out for analysis of your DNA. But during COVID, what's come more, become more and more common is that we can actually use saliva samples. So genetic testing labs are often able to mail to your home a saliva collection kit like you can see in the picture, you spit into a little tube and close it back up and mail it back out for the genetic testing lab to do analysis. Um, blood and saliva have the same accuracy, so you're not getting a worse test if you decide to submit a saliva sample. The only difference that can sometimes happen is that we find that your saliva has usually a little bit less of your DNA in it, and what that means is that it's possible that the lab will recontact you after you submit a sample and say there wasn't enough DNA for us to do the test. So you'll never get a substandard test. You might just get the lab saying we need to try a new sample because we couldn't get enough DNA. And that even sometimes happens when people submit blood. We've just seen it a little bit more often in saliva than blood. So that's the only difference to think of and know. Um, genetic testing often is covered by insurance, but it depends on your personal and family history. So it's important to check and see if you meet your insurance's criteria. And if you don't, certain genetic testing labs um, offer self-pay prices or options to be able to pay out of pocket for people who are interested. 
Um, I do want to point out here while we're talking about genetic testing that you will see different labs or different options for where to send um, your test depending on what you're looking for. So your doctor, if they're looking for, again, that type of testing that's part of usually pathology to get better understanding of treatment options or that somatic testing, you might see labs like Foundation One. Um, that lab specifically looks at your tumor tissue and does not look for germline or hereditary risk. So you might talk about different labs or different places to send your testing if you're looking for a germline genetic test, and that's where you submit blood or saliva. Um, and some common ones that you might have heard of are things like Invite, Amber Genetics, Myriad Genetics. There's lots of different options out there, um, and any of those are likely not to test your tumor tissue, but it gets to test your blood or saliva for hereditary risk. So let's say that you have some genetic testing results or, or you have a new diagnosis and you want to think about talking to your family. We know that this is different for everybody. We know that sometimes this is hard to think about in terms of how to talk about this with other people. So I wanted to spend um, the last of our time just thinking about disclosure of results um, and just know that it is different for everybody. Um, genetic counselors are specifically trained to help talk to you about how to talk to your family. So please util utilize us. Please ask your doctor to see a genetic counselor if you haven't. We're happy to help you through this for your own personal specific situation. But it's important to consider um, when you're thinking about telling someone who it is that you're telling, um, your own comfort level, your feelings and your needs about this, and their needs and how they might feel about all of this together. So if you have genetic testing, reasons to share, I think there's eight of these, Lindsay, <laughs> if you wanna to click to get them all, um, is if you're sharing with relatives, it can provide an explanation of your whole family history. Your relatives understand what's been in the family history as well. And it might be actionable for them too. Um, it might be that you have a close relationship and this person can be a support system when you get these results to talk through with another person. Um, you might feel some relief talking to other people, just getting it out there. Um, you might know people who are educated about this that can kind of give you some more details if you want to get more information from someone. Um, and it, it sometimes, although not usually with health information, people might find out in a different way if they go to their own doctor and get their own genetic testing. So you may want to be proactive to tell them first. Um, but Lindsay, if you go to the next slide, there's also reasons people have not to share genetic testing results. I think there's nine of these ones. Um, and it, some of it is based on timing. But I think that it's important to think about this because there are sometimes reasons that it may not be helpful for you to talk to everybody about your results. And again, this is where it really becomes personal. Um, you might be trying to protect people um, by not telling them about risk or harm. Um, there might be a specific time in their life that you're, or in your lives, that you're looking to kind of wait for a better time and have this discussion. Um, you might learn about something that's not particularly actionable for that person that you're thinking of disclosing to. For example, some young children don't have hereditary risk yet because there's adult onset risks. And so there's nothing for them to do yet if they're positive. And you may consider the timing of, of when it starts being actionable for them. Or it, it might be someone that you're not close to, or you'd rather you know, think about your own privacy about who to share this with. So all of this is important to consider. Um, the next few slides I have are just thinking about who you're talking to and what's most important to think about. We can go th through these relatively quickly, but um, what you'll see is that the implications for you are often the same. So each person that you think about talking to, you should think through how you feel about it, what it means to you, what kind of support you might be getting from telling that person, or what your own hopes or fears are about it. So that bottom one is always gonna stay the same no matter who you're talking to about all of this. 
what the considerations usually um, change for are the implications for that person. So for example, your family members, if you are found to have a gene mutation, your family members are at risk to carry the same one. So this includes health implications for them and might be a more nuanced discussion to talk through about what that means for them personally. If you go to the next slide, um, the implications for your significant other are, may not be for their own health as much as it might be for your future children or children that you have. Um, and again, how they can directly support you as you go through extra screening or management or any differences in your health care. And then if you go to the last slide, if you think about disclosing to people outside of your family, this is mostly just how this can benefit you. Is there some extra way that you can be supported or someone in your office that you need to tell because you need an extra appointment to go get your screening MRI? And this is where you can also tailor how much information you give, right? You don't have to tell them everything. Um, they're not entitled to all of this information. It's just about whether it benefits you to be able to disclose it. Um, specifically, we think a lot about research in terms of how to talk to kids or how to talk to your kids about genetics or genetic testing. These steps came from a really great um, research paper that actually went through this. So step one, again, consider your own emotional reactions. Step two is to make a really specific plan. When am I going to talk about this? Are we all going to sit down for dinner and and who's going to be there and when is it going to be? And when we talk about it, let's make sure that there's enough time before anyone has to go to their next, you know, game or work or school or whatever it is. Um, and then step, step three and four is mostly just about leaving things open. If you're disclosing to your child, especially if they may have their own risks that come out of it, is to leave a lot of openness for them to ask their own questions and for them to guide the conversation. So you can start with things really slow or vague and then allow them to guide where their questions come from and answer what's asked. Um, and then of course, just leaving space for them to react, letting them think through it before maybe you answer more questions. So step five, that kind of circles back the for all the time after your one talk is um, just continued ongoing dialogue about this. Some people take longer to process before they come up with their questions. And we suggest as much as you can to just be open, to have that openness where it can become normalized in a conversation that you all have together. Um, this paper came out of specifically talking about if you have one of these gene mutations, how to talk to your kids, but it can really be used, I think, in a lot of situations, at least for a first framework. And again, as genetic counselors, we're happy to think through a little bit more specifically what words can you use, how to really phrase this, what to say first, et cetera. I think this is our last slide, is just if you're motivated now to find a genetic counselor. Um, our National Society of Genetic Counselors specifically has a tool where you can stick your zip code, what type of genetic counselor you're looking for, um, whether you're open to telehealth, and it'll kind of pull up the list and who to contact and where to go to from there. Um, your doctors or healthcare providers you already have may also have referrals or people that they typically send to. And, and Lindsay and I are always happy to help as well if you have more questions or if we can help coordinate. Um, so there's our contact information on the slide here and we are very happy to take questions. Thank you all so much. Thank you both. So we have a few questions that came in. I'll get started. Uh, first question, what is the safest way to have children with SDH type GIST? Is there testing for IVF or early in utero if doing a natural birth? Um, testing in terms of our, like just having a child, because you can do um, the IVF process if you're trying to sort of prevent the SDH mutation from being passed on. Um, through a technology called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Um, but if it's just more about the diagnosis itself and how you deliver, then that's really got to be done by your OBGYN um, and whoever would be following you. 
um, throughout the pregnancy. That would be definitely out of Becca and I's area of expertise. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, just to add quickly, it's that's another one where there's lots of kind of personal decisions that come to play. Many people decide to have children and then um, pursue genetic testing for their children when they get closer to the age of actionability, right? The first age where they would start screening or management and then learn if they're positive or negative for this hereditary risk. Like Lindsay said, another option is that IVF and what we call PGD process. So more things to think about as a family for what works best or for what you're most interested in. Okay, thank you. What should my daughter do over the next few years to keep a check on ourselves and what changes to be aware of in ourselves? My daughter's 25 and has SDHA, wild type gist, removed from her stomach. When she was 17, a benign Carney's triad removed from her lung. I had genetic testing three years ago and a full body MRI, which fortunately was all clear. The person's in the UK and the daughter's in Australia for the past three years. So what we can say is what we would do at Data Farber um, and for our SDHA carriers, we are actually doing um, a modified full body MRI um, to look for FIOs and paras. Um, and we are doing them every three years. Um, in addition to the blood work that would look for that increased risk um, based on the hormones that they're looking. So if a pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma is releasing hormones, um, then that blood work should notify us about it. Um, the risks are much lower for those, um, for pheochromocytomas and paraganglioma's to form in individuals who have SDHA mutations. So we do think imaging every three years is totally appropriate. If you, however, notice any fluctuations in blood pressure, heightened anxiety, um, palpitation, so your heart beats really fast, those are all symptoms that should be brought immediately to your doctor, um, as they are all symptoms that can be the result of a FEO, chromocytoma, or a, a hormone-releasing tumor. Okay, my wife had a FEO and para, and my twins have inherited her faulty SDHB gene, unfortunately with inoperable tumors in their neck. My wife's elder brother from genetic testing discovered he also has inherited the faulty SDHB gene, as has his son. However, fortunately, neither my brother-in-law or my nephew have any problems with their faulty gene. My question is, why is this? Yeah, that goes back to that idea that all of this is about risk, right? It's about having, if you have that mutation in that STHP that you inherited, then you have a higher chance than other people to develop those PO or para diagnoses, but it doesn't mean that you're definitely going to get diagnosed. Um, and, and so we do see this. We see, first of all, there's that 50-50 chance to inherit the mutation in general, to inherit that risk. And then there's risks to even just develop the tumor or not. Um, to be honest, we don't have lots of detail in terms of exactly why, besides just this idea of those risk numbers or percentages. Okay, so this person has a science background directed to Lindsay. <laughs> you mentioned <laughs> protein testing of tumors. Can you explain what kind of test is done? This person has worked um, in bio, bio of cancer. So she wants to understand the test and the protein size, sequencing, et cetera. Um, so I'll do a very short overview of it. Um, we primarily use immunohistochemistry um, as our protein test. So it really is, um, for the SDH genes, pretty common um, to be done, at least at our institution, on any GIST, FIO, or para that is removed at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, and it basically says, are these proteins there? Meaning the genes are working or are they not? Past that, that would have to be discussed with someone who has a better understanding um, of the protein test. Potentially, Becca may have something to add to that. I think that's a good overview. <laughs> Okay, great. So with the rare GIST PDGFRA XN12 tumor mutation diagnosis and no known familial GIST history, can you go back to a lab that already has your DNA results, such as 23andMe, to ask for additional somatic detail? Or do you need to send another dedicated swab of DNA to test? 
usually a new one. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. it's very rare cases where a lab that already has your DNA will be able to go back and give you more detail. Um, it, there's a few different reasons for it. Um, one is that some labs do different types of testing than others. So some labs, like you mentioned 23andMe, usually don't analyze the same genes. So that data. Um, the other is that if you had it previously, then technology may have already changed in terms of how we're looking at those genes, depending on how long ago you did that test. So a lab will always want to use the newest technology to do this analysis and look further. Okay, can syndromic just be ruled out through genetic testing, such as Carney's triad? In our, in our recent genetic assessment, our counselor was saying that syndromic just is not likely, but can that be concluded? But can that be concluded at this point? My daughter had sporadic multifocal just in the antrum with an SDH somatic change, no mutation detected. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that it's ruled out. Um, all of the syndromic reasons we know to date. Um, so as genetics professionals, we always put the caveat as of today, um, our understanding is constantly changing. And so there could be additional genes that we don't know yet that could be related to just or to FIOs or to paras. Um, and that's sort of why for someone who is negative, we sometimes will still say, maybe check back in with us in like three to five years to see if technology has changed. Um, if they identified a somatic cause of it, then I would feel fairly certain it probably is not syndromic. I just don't know that we ever say 100% or 0%. Um, we always live in the in-between world, um, which is probably what your genetic counselor was alluding to. Um, anything being done with GIST and CRISPR technology, as well as what is the maximum number of genes currently being tested? This person had 83 done in 2018. So nothing that I know of with CRISPR yet. Um, the reason that I usually like to describe is when we think of CRISPR, you're thinking of editing your genes. And usually in research, this type of editing is mostly focused on small numbers of genes. So like if you have an embryo, um, and this isn't done clinically, but one of the theories is that, again, if someone has IVF and they have a mutation in the embryo, this is a small group of genes that they might be able to use CRISPR to remove that mutation or change that mutation. But once you are a full human, you are made of thousands and thousands of genes. So figuring out how to use that same technology to target all of them and to change the genes that you have in your body is much more difficult. Um, it is something that people talk about and think about how CRISPR might be used, um, but not something that I think will be coming into to action in the, at least within the near future. Um, and the panel tests, um, so there's 84 now is the largest, but generally if the addition is a gene or even honestly a handful of genes, we're probably going to say don't bother updating testing now, check in with us in a few years and see how many more genes we have available at that point. Okay, um, we're at the one o'clock hour, so um, I'm going to see, I'm just going to slide in one more question and then we'll, we'll conclude. Can you address um, if genetic testing is useful in helping to determine frequency of imaging, such as scans with contrast versus the risk of radiation slash contrast exposure? I thought that was a good question to ask. Sure, absolutely. Yes. Some of the, the recommendations that come out of someone having a mutation is how often to get their screening, again, with that goal of early detection. And when any of those professional recommendations come out, they're focused on basically balancing um, risk, right? So one of the reasons that the frequency of screening is chosen is that the risk of the exposures that you get from that screening within that amount of time is outweighed by the benefit of getting that screening of potential early detection of a diagnosis. So the reason that you'll see different frequencies for gene mutations is because of 
size that person's risk might be of developing a certain tumor because that tumor it may be slower or faster growing. Um, so they can kind of, if it's slow growing, extend out how often screening. And so all of this is really weighing kind of pros and cons based on what type of screening is offered, the risk that screening is, but what the risk you were born with with the mutation as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to conclude this webinar. I want to thank both Lindsay and Becca for your time today. It was very informative. Everybody um, can see their contact information if they have follow questions after the webinar. But I want to thank everybody for their time today and look looking forward to having you join us for our next webinar series in the coming days. Have a great Thanks day, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.